Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Cochlear implants. Pretty neat. A cochlear implant is an electronic device that partially restores hearing. Now, we know it can help children with severe hearing loss, but what about adults? Who's a candidate and what's involved and how do they work? Here to explain is Mayo Clinic ear, nose, and throat specialist, Dr. Matthew Carlson, and Mayo Clinic audiologist, Dr. Aniket Soji. Welcome both of you to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Dr. Carlson, Dr. Soji, so good to have both of you to talk about something that I, I think most of us have only heard about being used in children, a cochlear implant, but adults are candidates too, right? Absolutely. And who? Yeah, so that's a good question. You know, hearing loss is a very prevalent condition. As we age, we acquire hearing loss or from noise exposure from a lot of different causes. Um, but a lot of people, the hearing loss progresses to a point where hearing aids no longer help them anymore. And that group in particular, particularly when there's background noise and things and they aren't able to participate in their regular social activities, that's the group of people that we, we start to think maybe they might benefit from a cochlear implant. Do you, uh, are these patients that, Dr. Soji being an audiologist, you see these patients and uh, you have prescribed hearing aids uh, previously and they, they fail to work after a period of time. Is, are these the kind of patients that you then send to Dr. Carlson? Yeah, these are the patients who uh, used to derive benefit with hearing aids, but over time, because of gradual progression of their hearing impairment, they are uh, having difficulty in understanding speech in the presence of background noise, and over time, hearing aids have started uh, providing minimal benefit. So these are the patients whom we refer for cochlear implantation. Men more than women? Um, I don't think so. It's probably equal. Uh, um, maybe men more because they work in noisy situations more than women, but uh, it all depends on the degree of hearing loss that the patients have. It seems like because hearing aid technology is getting so much better, I see so many more people who are using hearing aids. Is the same thing happening with cochlear implants? Is there an increase in the number of people that are receiving them? Yeah, that's definitely true. There's, um, with a lot of, like a lot of things, there's been an expansion of FDA labeling for cochlear implantation in adults. And so it used to be in 1985 when they were first approved by the FDA, you had to be completely deaf. You couldn't have any hearing at all. And then over time, uh, the labeling criteria have expanded to include a lot of people that still can't hear very well but still have some residual hearing. And so as the, as the criteria have broadened, so has the pool of people who might be candidates for cochlear implantation. So if Dr. Soji sends you a patient that he thinks is a candidate, what more do you do to determine if in fact they are a good candidate? Yeah, there's a lot of things you, can, uh, you need to look at. I would say that first of all, the great majority of people who have very advanced hearing loss who aren't deriving benefit from a hearing aid will be a medical candidate for a cochlear implant. There's very few conditions that would preclude a cochlear implant from working very well. In adults, that's particularly true. Sometimes children are born without, with a very severe malformed inner ear, or sometimes even born without a cochlear nerve. But for an adult who acquires hearing loss in their adult life, they almost always have normal um, cochlear anatomy. They always have a cochlear nerve. So in that way, they're very good candidates. The very few exceptions are, um, perhaps the person with meningitis where the inner ear is scarred shut and you can't get a cochlear implant in there. And then there's a couple other very rare circumstances, but the great majority of people are medical candidates for cochlear implants if they have more advanced hearing loss. So it's very rare that we'd say, it's almost almost never where we'd say someone's too old for a cochlear implant or someone's too sick to get a cochlear implant with a surgical procedure just because it's, it's a low risk outpatient procedure and people do well with it. Is the uh, audiogram or the hearing test all you need to determine if they're a candidate or did you do further testing? So we really look at it from two perspectives. We look at it from are they an audiometric candidate and we, the big question is will they do better with a cochlear implant than they currently do with a hearing aid? And there's a lot of different ways you can test that, but that's the big question from an audiometric standpoint. And then from a medical standpoint, we say, um, are they fit to undergo the surgery uh, overall? And again, that answer is almost always um, yes. We typically get an MRI ahead of time just to, nav just to understand the anatomy and make sure there's nothing else that would preclude placement. Again, that's very rare that that would happen. But really, those are the ingredients we need. You know, it's interesting you bring up an audiogram because an audiogram is um, the, mo the most classic way we think about how much a person has hearing loss. But the audiogram itself doesn't do a great job of really identifying who's a candidate or not. There's a lot of people who will be uh, do okay on their audiogram test, but then if you give them a little background noise or another some other more difficult testing, which replicates more real-world listening environment, they'll mm -hmm. actually plummet in their scores very quickly. And so 
we think about not just the audiogram, but what a person says. If they, even if they score okay on the audiogram and they say, I'm really struggling, even though the audiogram looks okay, we'll tend to test them in different situations to see if they can qualify. Has it changed the way that you test these people, the, these patients, Dr. Soji? Yeah, previously we used to test in quiet, and um, that is there is no presence of background noise. We used to just play some sentences and ask the patients to repeat them back. Over time, we have realized that implant patients perform really well in the presence of background noise. So we have started introducing uh, something called as a multi-talker babble, which simulates kind of 15, 20 people talking in the background. And a multi-talker like babble. Yeah. Gotcha. Or being at my house. With my yeah, kids. I was going to yeah. say, hang out with us. Same thing. <laughs> so, yeah, these days uh, it is common practice to test patients in the presence of background noise, mm. a significant amount of background noise, and determine if they would qualify to get a cochlear implant. Hmm. So tell us briefly about the procedure. Yeah, so cochlear implantation entails a very a relatively short outpatient procedure. Uh, depending on um, a number of factors, typically the surgery will uh, take about an hour to an hour and a half to perform. Hmm. It's performed through an incision behind the ear. You don't have to shave really any hair, or minimal hair. The incision is small enough where it's not something you can see externally unless you pulled your ear forward. So it's pretty, uh, pretty minimally invasive from that standpoint. Uh, that you then drill the bone of the mastoid, uh, part of the skull, and that just lets you see the cochlea or the organ of hearing. The mastoid itself has no function, so drilling it or not drilling it, the person's no different. You can put a hole in that thing, yeah, no problem. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so then you drill away the bone, you can see the cochlea, and once you see the cochlea, you make a tiny opening that's under a high-power microscope, and then you thread a group of wires in there, and the wires give just enough electrical current to stimulate the nerve endings that really aren't uh, receptive to the regular sound that we hear um, and then you close everything up, and then about two weeks later, we turn it on. And uh, for, the, for the first time in a long time, people will hear a lot of sounds they haven't heard. Why do you have to wait two weeks? So that's a very good question. Uh, a lot of, I would say that the, the answer to that is probably that's convention, but no other reason. <laughs> We've been, uh, and actually Dr., uh, Dr. Sauji is very progressive in a lot of things. He's um, relatively new in our program, and he's done a lot. He's really pushed the envelope with a lot of things. And one thing he has pushed, which has been very, uh, very interesting and very cool, I think, for our patients, the same day activation of the cochlear implant. So the main reason why we didn't do it before is because there's a surgical incision and maybe it hurts just a little bit to have the device on there, but the incisions are so small and people in the anesthetic time so short, they wake up pretty quick. And so now uh, Dr. Sauji is actually turning the devices on in the PACU. And so they're leaving the hospital with hearing That's sometimes. That's the recovery room. Yep. Yeah. yep. Amazing. So then there's some rehabilitation. Do you have to teach the, the patients something about how, how to use this device? Yeah. Um, one thing that the patients have to become familiar is with all the equipment and what is a battery, what is a rechargeable battery, how do you place the battery on, how do you put the processor on, and uh, what kind of programs, uh, uh, options they have. Uh, there is a program for quiet situation, there's a program for noisy situation. So just learning a little bit about their implant and uh, getting used to the new sound quality. Initially, when we switch them on, um, uh, patients commonly report it to be garbled or squeaky or uh, robotic sound quality. But within no time, the brain gets used to the new sound quality and everything starts falling in place. Are most patients who have this pretty satisfied? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with good screening to identify those patients who are struggling. Um, but I think with good screening, the, the the number of people who would say that they wouldn't have done it again or regret doing it is, is extremely low. And I think that has to do with the rate, the benefit risk ratio of the procedure. The risks are relatively low. People um, adjust to it relative, uh, very well, uh, pretty quick. And, and so it's very uncommon that we have somebody say they regret doing it. I'd say a lot of that has to do with screening and getting the right patients and things, but it's a, it's a, I would say in otolaryngology and specifically in otology, it's the most significant biggest breakthrough uh, our development in our field in the last 30 years. How many of these do you do a year? Uh, so collectively, our group uh, does about 200 a year, and that includes adults and children, and about 30% are children, about 70% are adults. Pretty amazing. Well, cochlear implants aren't just for kids. If you're an adult with severe hearing loss and hearing aids don't really help or they've stopped helping you enough, you may be a candidate for a cochlear implant. The surgery, generally safe. The results will vary from person to person, and there is an adjustment period and a rehabilitation period following the surgery. But uh, after the device is implanted, most patients are extremely happy. And it's pretty amazing technology. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic ear, nose, and throat specialist, Dr. Matthew Carlson, and Mayo Clinic audiologist, Dr. Anna Katsoji.